Howdy folks, welcome back to the Steampunk Desperado channel. Looking forward to another great year of steampunk and historical fiction on this channel. A couple weeks ago, I did a review of the new streaming series on Amazon it's called Carnival Row, which is fantastic because it's steampunk. And I'm hoping that this is going to be successful, unlike certain recent projects like Mortal Engines, which unfortunately fell short in audience in getting the audience excited and into it. Anyway, this is by Renee Echeverria and Travis Beecham. And uh, a little warning here, I'm going to give spoilers in this one, because the last one I had only watched five shows, and I basically gave my overall impression. Today I'm going to talk about my thoughts about the conclusion. Now, Carnival Row takes place in a, in a Victorian-type fantasy world where the fae, that is, you know, mythical creatures like fairies and satyrs, are real. And in fact, they are refugees in a, in a country called the Berg. Their homeland, Tiranoc, has been overrun by this evil, tyrannical human nation called the Pact. And the Berg, which is a democratic nation, and they're a lot like Victorian England, without, except without a king, and they ended up losing the war and they took in a lot of these Fey as refugees. Now the Fey have several types. They are, they include the fairies or picks are like human-sized, human-sized fairies with like butterfly-type wings. They can fly. The pucks, or which are like satyrs, have horns on their heads and kind of goat-like legs. They, there are also centaurs, trolls, and kobolds, which are kind of like little gremlins, but those don't uh, play into the series that much. Now, one of the things about it that I was, I mean, I loved the, the costumes and the story and the characters and so on. Um, the uh, effects were a little bit of a mixed bag, but one of the things that, themes that was in there was that the Fae as refugees were treated rather badly. They're definitely second-class citizens, and there's a lot of racism, and there were very few humans that were that were laudable, likable characters, which which kind of made me worry that maybe this was a metaphor for uh, the refugee crisis, and you know, a little bit heavy-handed. So my the best, the most likable human character was Philo uh, Rycroft Philostrate. He's a He's a, a police inspector with the Berg's constabulary, and it turns out that he's half Fey, as you discover later on. So of course he's sympathetic to the Fey, and it uh, it kind of negates the virtue that you see in him at first. His lover is Vignette Stone Moss, uh, and uh, she's a former resistance fighter for Fey, and she's now a refugee, and they've, they've got this really stormy, stormy relationship because she thought he was dead and and uh, and uh, she was all mourning and then they, she finds out he's still alive and all that and she's very upset with him uh, because he didn't because he left without telling her he left Tyrannoc because he was a soldier in the war and uh, while she and they became lovers while they were there so that's that's a continuing theme as you go through the rest of the the episodes and uh, a friend assured me that it was going to become more nuanced. That I, it wasn't entirely, entirely uh, a political thing, and, and I do think it's gotten more nuanced. For one thing, I read a prequel, which was available as an audiobook uh, on, on Audible uh, by Stephanie K. Smith, called um, "Tangle in the Dark," which told the, told from the viewpoint of Tourmaline Larue, which is Vignette's former lover. Uh, at one, at one time, the poet laureate of Tiranoc, now a prostitute in a the seedy Carnival Row in the Berg, very sad. And uh, they were. She describes how things get worse and worse as the pack keeps invading their land, and they, they the the they're very decadent. You know, the fair rather decadent. They're interested in poetry and art, and they don't want to defend their homeland. And they. They get um, occupied by the Berg, ostensibly to protect them from the pack, but the Berg become oppressive too. Eventually, not never as bad as the pack, but eventually they lose, and uh, the Fey have to go away as refugees. So it gives you a, a more uh, more balanced view of the Fey as flawed individuals as well. Another theme that comes up 
uh, as you go on in the series one is that terrorism is bad. <laughs> For one thing, Vignette joins a uh, fixed terrorist group and uh, witnesses the leader murder one of the one of the comrades that she thinks has been collaborating with the humans. Furthermore, there's this group of of pucks, uh, the satyr type guys, who are this fanatical religious cult, uh, reminiscent a little bit of the penitente. They uh, they whip themselves, but they also are, are like fanatics like Al Qaeda, and they end up assassinating the chancellor of the Berg, um, and uh, he is just about to sign, just about to sign a a uh, bill to or proclamation to. Uh, have better treatment of the Fae, as he's just discovered that um, he's just discovered that Philo is his illegitimate son. His son, his son Jonah Breakspear, is succeeds him and declares a state of emergency, making things far worse for the Fae because they're all like confined to the ghetto surrounding Carnival Row. And uh, one of the things about Philo's character finally embraces his fayness. He's been discovered as a as a half breed, and he's really been he's been beaten and accused of murder. And he also gets himself confined to Carnival Row so he can be with his love, his true love, Vignette. Um, so that's another th another theme. Furthermore, we have some interesting political machinations here. Uh, although it is a male dominant society, it's not not so much of a theme of patriarchy because. The leading villains are female. We have uh, we have uh, Jonah's mother, Piety, scheming for her son, and it turns out she's like behind a lot of these grisly murders that have been committed, in order to protect him and fulfill this prophecy that he will be the world's leader. Another interesting wicked woman happens to be Sophie Longerbane, who was the daughter of the Breakspears uh, primary rival. She is played by the gorgeous Carolyn Ford, and is the only young female lead who doesn't take off her clothes in the series so far. Uh, so it makes, it makes her a little bit more intriguing. And, uh, and she and Jonah become lovers, which is also interesting because they turn out to be half-siblings. <laughs> so you have a little bit of a Game of Thrones thing going on there. And one of, and, and Jonah, who is a little bit more, he a little bit more naive, asks Sophie what her goal is, why she has been scheming behind behind everybody's backs, trying to do all these wicked things, and she says chaos is her goal, because as in promoting chaos, she can achieve power. Now this sounds a lot like a lot of the conspiracy theories you see on the net, especially theories from the right. Such and such a group is trying to promote chaos. So I found that very interesting. It gives kind of a balance to the series as a whole. Now I, I hear that they are coming out with a second season, which is great. Unfortunately, it's not slated to appear till summer of 2021, which is horrible. Not only do I have to wait for it, but also a lot of times the audience loses interest if, if there's a big break like that. For example, there was a very, very popular anime called Attack on Titan, which had this huge gap between the first and second seasons, and it, and it really lost a lot of momentum when it did so. But I will definitely check it out when it comes back, and hopefully, hopefully it will come back on time, unlike Attack on Titan. In, in my previous review, I did, a, I did a rating of four out of five years, primarily because I thought the show I mean, as much as I loved it, I had a little problem with the effects being cheap in places, and I also thought it was a little bit too political, politically strident. However, in light of the more nuanced uh, Machiavellian things going on, it makes it more interesting, and the characters being more, uh, being more um, varied, I will give it 4.5 out of 5 gears. And I definitely recommend it to any steampunk fans who aren't too prudish, who don't mind seeing some very attractive actors take off their clothes occasionally. So for now, this is Vaughn Troidy, the Steampunk Desperado, saying adios amigos from the Steampunk Desperado channel, where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary.